<coughs> Good afternoon. This is Ray Tsuchiyama for All About Leadership on ThinkTech Hawaii. We have a guest today who's based in Kobe, Japan, and has been interacting with Asia for much of his life, but also with Hawaii in that he spent some time in the late 1990s getting a business degree, an MBA, in fact, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, now the Scheidler uh, College of Business. And welcome to the show, Steve Zerker. Yes, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, right? This now, is a delight. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for taking the time out of your uh, uh, business and, and teaching activities right. to be with us today. Yep. And the reason why I'm so excited to have you on the show, Steve, is that we're going to talk about Japan and taking its pulse in mid-2018. This is July 11th. Uh, pretty soon, uh, 2020, uh, August, hot, I think, uh, hot August, will come to the Olympics, as you yeah. know. Oh, boy. Not, a, not a good time. Yeah, many but, people leave Tokyo in August. And that, many, yeah. That's right, that's right. And they're all in Hawaii. Uh, that, <laughs> yeah, uh, Obon, exactly. Obon. But uh, uh, the Olympics will make Tokyo the center of, of world media attention. Right. And I, I lived through that in 64. I was in Yokohama. Oh, you were? Wow. That's right, that's okay. right. That's how uh, historical I am. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, uh, so, Steve, tell me what you do now. Okay, well, um, I am a professor and a dean at Kansai Gaidai University, which is in Hirakata, in between Kyoto and Osaka. I've been there since 2011. So I'm a business teacher. <clears throat> I teach entrepreneurship, marketing, uh, project management, those types of classes. Kansai Gaidai is well known uh, in terms of supporting foreign students that come on exchange programs. For example, this fall we'll have about 340 students, primarily from America, but also from all over the world, coming to study. And those are my students. So I teach them entrepreneurship within a Japanese setting, marketing across culture class, and so forth. About two, three years ago, I also became the dean of the Asian Studies program. I have to explain, before I became a teacher, I was a business person, right, manager, right. vice president, that type of thing. So when I first started teaching, I thought, oh, this is a nice life. I'll be just teaching. But that management habit kicked in again. <laughs> and I guess they recognized some ability, so they promoted me to dean. So I've been running the Asian Studies program as a dean <clears throat> for the last two or three years So as you're well. involved in an interesting uh, situation. You're uh, with Americans and, and uh, of course, people from Europe, from uh, China, South Korea, from throughout Asia, yes. throughout the world, yes. uh, as your students, but yes. you're based in uh, this uh, university in uh, north of Osaka. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, student body, <clears throat> my classes, is mostly made of Europeans, Northern Europeans, Germans, and so forth. For some reason, that group tends to take business courses, right, right. whereas the Americans are usually taking more anthropology or sociology type courses. But yes, it's within a Japanese setting. It's a Japanese university. It's run in a very Japanese way. So it's an interesting contrast between my student activity and then my, my leadership activity and my uh, management activity within the university. And how long do they stay, uh, uh, these foreign students at Kansai Gai? They, what, part of the idea when they started this program back in the 1970s was to adopt the Western schedule. Mm. Uh, you probably know, Ray, maybe right. your, your uh, Viewers don't know that the Japanese right. school schedule is actually offset from the rest of the world. Right. For it example, starts in April. April. Yeah, fact. the spring semester starts <laughs> yeah. in April. Yeah. Um, so what we did is uh, we followed the Western program because we were trying to oh. attract American students. Right. So um, the next semester will start in the, about the last week of August and right. we'll run through mid-December. So that's the fall, right. the right. traditional fall, fall, fall semester. semester. Then we'll pick up again the last week of January and run till the end of May. Right. And then, of course, they have the summer off. And, and uh, you've been teaching these um, students for some time. And yes, I have. What motivates them to come all the way to uh, Japan and Osaka well, to study for a semester or two? Y yes, well, um, last year, according to Open Doors, which is this agency that tracks exchange students right. between the United States, you've heard of it? Yeah. Between the United States, Japan was number two in terms of wow. growth for foreign students. Cuba had the most American students, I guess because Obama opened that up a few oh, years okay. ago. That's interesting. They were probably starting from zero, yeah, so it's yeah, easy right, to grow right. from there. 
Exponen Japan, exponential increase there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but Japan had 18% growth year wow. over year in the last year. So the number of American students coming to Japan yeah. is increasing. And why do they come? Well, most often they get hooked on Japan when they're in grammar school. Right. And it's anime and manga. Right, of course. Those are the things. It's yeah. kind of the soft arts of right. Japan that attracts the students. And I have to tell you, it's not just students. But I've also been hiring, and part of my responsibility as a dean, I've hired 20 professors over the last wow. two and a half years. Yeah, Kansai Gaide has yeah, gone on a great. hiring binge. Yeah, yeah. So, and when I go back, I actually have eight more interviews wow. in, in August. And even them, sometimes I ask them, why are you interested in Japan? Yeah. And they'll kind of lower their head a little bit and say, anime. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's one of the main desires. But I, I also think now that um, the Jap Japanese economy is stabilizing, I know we're going to talk about right. this later, um, <clears throat> some students are coming to Japan because they want to work. Well, wow, yes. Yeah. And this is something that's yeah. changed entirely in the last mm. six years. When I started teaching, students would ask me, can I get a job in Japan? These are foreign students. Right. And I would say, I'll do what I can, but right. don't get your hopes up. Right. Now, Japanese companies are hiring foreigners at an unprecedented rate. So some students have learned that, and they're coming to Japan to study, learn the language, with the hope of eventually working in Japan. Now, that, that has, um, of course, uh, a correlation to demographics in Japan. Yes. Aging workforce, that's number sure. one. Sure. Lack of immigration or, you know, some kind right. of government uh, program to uh, increase uh, mm -hmm. foreigners coming to Japan to work. Yeah. Uh, and, and also um, the, the need to globalize for a lot of companies trying yep. to sell or market goods, uh, products, and services right. outside of Japan. That's correct. Uh, now, uh, but also you have... Um, uh, your students who are genuinely interested in Japan right. and want to work there yes. post-college. Now, yes. that didn't really occur until just a few years ago. I mean, it, yeah. It, well, it, there wasn't, yeah. as I was mentioned before, there wasn't the opportunity. Right. The Japanese companies would tend to not be interested in hiring foreigners, right. but now they are. And I think, you know, it's, it's snowballing. Right. Japanese oh. companies are hiring foreigners. Foreign students are coming to Japan because they know they can potentially, maybe in the first stage of their career, work in Japan. And uh, yeah, some of the factors behind that is that um, other than the name brand companies that we all know, uh, the majority of Japanese companies have always been focusing on the domestic economy right. primarily, even though they may have products and services that could be exported successfully. But now I think it's internalized throughout the business community in Japan that the future in terms of growth is mm -hmm. outside of Japan. Right. So how do you uh, bridge Right. Between the Japanese domestic economy to the foreign economy. And the Japanese companies are beginning to recognize, well, you know, maybe, I don't know if this is a, a long-term solution or not, but they're thinking, at least now, we'll hire foreigners to help us. Well, that's quite exciting uh, because, you know, barely 20 years ago, one pathway was the JET program. You know, many, oh, yeah, many, that's still yeah, very, very powerful. Uh, young people growing. came to Japan to teach English. That's correct. And then uh, they had opportunities to join the local prefecture office or the yes. city office or companies right. and, and uh, marketing and sales yeah. because uh, to leverage English skills for yes. a lot of small co uh, uh, companies, say, in, in uh, Sapporo or Fukuoka, <laughs> or, uh, that did not have, you know, uh, many uh, English speakers to kind of assist them. Sure. And that was one pathway. Yes. Uh, so getting back to where do they find the work? Uh, is it uh, a, a widespread of industries? Is it IT, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals? Is it a service? Uh, what, what would that, those uh, key industry segments be? Yeah. I, well, when you mentioned IT, <clears throat> as with the United States, there's a chronic shortage for IT programmers. Um, and in Japan, if you have an IT background, some kind of computer science, experience or degree work, it's very easy to find work. So Gaida doesn't attract, Kansai Gaida doesn't attract mm -hmm. a lot of IT uh, students. We get maybe out of the 340, we'll have maybe 15 or so. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for me to help them to find a position. Oh, so that is yeah. a tremendous demand. There's a, a huge shortage of IT professionals. In fact, this is a problem Japan has over the longer term. Right. Japan's always been somewhat weak in the software area. Right. And as you know, now software, as they yeah. say, is eating the world. Right. So Japan has some catch up there. So that's one area where there's a definite need, but also <clears throat> tourism. Oh, yes. Right, because now foreigners from all over the world are coming to Japan and hotels, uh, restaurants, tourism agencies, and so forth are recognizing our clientele is changing dramatically. It used to be 95% Japanese and 5% foreign. Now it's 80% Japanese and 20% foreign. Three or four years from now, it'll be 50% Japanese and 50% right. foreign. 
So many students are, are graduating and going into agencies having to do with tourism, or in some instances, it's products or services that are developed in Japan, like the sake right, industry, right. that is attempting to go global now. Right. They recognize that they cannot just rely on the Japanese market to sustain their business over the long term. That's right. In fact, uh, uh, sake uh, consumption has declined <laughs> over the past few years. That's right. Uh, yeah. And, and, it's and, like soy sauce, too. Yeah. That's <laughs> Kiko Mons is a perfect example. Their biggest market is America. Wow. And so they made yeah. that move many, many years right. ago. They were in advance. So Japanese companies that didn't are now all addressing that. Then, but the key to um, you know interaction, especially in the service industry and and helping on tourism, is also language, Japanese language. Now, with your right. students coming in, uh, do some of them actively um, uh, study Japanese or yes. try to uh, really get a uh, really good um, hold of that uh, for yeah. uh, for the work office? All, all of our foreign students that come to study at Kansai Gaidai, it's mandatory for them to study oh. Japanese. And I would say that probably a quarter of our students have fairly high level Japanese. So for them, it's much easier to transition into more traditional companies where it would require Japanese. Right. But in the tourism industry, even those foreigners who do not have strong Japanese skills, maybe they're just conversational level, they'll be hired as well because their clientele will not be Japanese, it'll maybe be Germans. So they'll hire Germans oh, for right, that. Right. Yes, or Koreans. Right. So, right. so they're beginning to recognize that there's enough of a base of tourists from France or Germany or right. or Russia or wherever. Well, during the last uh, ten years or so, uh, uh, there's been a shift of English, English salespeople in Akihabara to Chinese Mandarin. <laughs> oh, <laughs> dramatically. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's that's a huge shift uh, right. right there. Yes, exactly. And, and we've been talking about tourism and Niseko, a famous ski uh, <laughs> spot in Hokkaido, right. and now dominated by Australian and New Zealand uh, yeah. entrepreneurs, right. catering to a global uh, market from uh, Korea, Taiwan, China, and the U.S. Yeah. and and Australia, and New Zealand. So if you're in. Australian and you want to work in Hokkaido, yeah. you can't. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because your clientele are Australian, so, right. so for me, I'd have to learn Australian. <laughs> <laughs> but I would never have thought of that. I know, because, it's just you know, because I, you know, I used to go there as a child because my mother's from Hokkaido, and again, that would be the last global place yeah. in Japan to me, right. and 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 uh, Tokyo was it for uh, very much uh, sure. uh, for decades right. as a center for dealing with foreigners and, and globalization. Yeah. Uh, and, and can can you s say any tips for Hawaii people, entrepreneurs, uh, oh. to take advantage of this okay. uh, uh, tourism boom? We, we seem to be well, focusing on this, so yeah, this is a good topic. You, uh, you know, one huge trend in Japan right now is Hawaiian products. Right, right, right. Yeah. So tomorrow in my entrepreneurship class in UH, I have Ed Schultz, who's the founder of Honolulu Coffee. That's right, yeah, yeah. He has established a partnership in Japan and has several stores there, and they're doing extremely wow. well. Uh, eggs, it was eggs and things. Yeah, that's right. That's they're right. in, they're, the they're in Kobe. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> of all places. I, know. <laughs> I would so, never think Kobe. Yeah. I, uh, J Japanese people, as you know, they love coming right. to Hawaii and they go back and they miss Hawaii. Yeah. So, selling products and services in Japan for Hawaiian businesses, I think, would be a, a very realistic opportunity for them to. to but you think know, about. you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the, the data we have is like. 500 to 600,000 people in Japan study the hula and Hawaiian music. There is no... My father-in-law studied the ukulele. <laughs> There's no <laughs> segment like that did. in China, Korea, or other countries. No. Japan is unique. Yeah. And uh, I think there's a, also a tip that I'm uh, also having an article in Hawaii Business on this uh, yeah. uh, tips mm -hmm. for uh, Hawaii uh, entrepreneurs, is that uh, the key to success is having a Hawaiian story. To, yes. your, to your a brand, to your product or right. service. Yeah. So in the case of Honolulu Coffee, that's very clear. Because the, the motif, the decoration, when you go in, it's all Hawaiian. The menu includes Hawaiian products. And by the way, um, Ed tells me that the, the highest profit that they make right. is on the pancakes and right. well, you know the, yeah. the food. <laughs> it, you know, it's even yeah. though it's named Honolulu Coffee, right, right, the right. primary well, attraction. And again, yeah. it's usually uh, Japanese women who yeah. are who want to eat. You know, they they will right. buy one plate and then share. Well, this, we'll, this is the recipe for success. Well, we'll, we'll, go, to Ed. we'll explore that even uh, more after we take a break. This okay. is Think Tech Hawaii, all about leadership. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king, come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war, you could 
talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master. Don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha. Hi, we are back with a scintillating conversation <laughs> on uh, how Japan is changing just in a few years about tourism, uh, all kinds of tourists globally who are coming to Japan, even to Niseko in Hokkaido, even exit things opening up in Kobe, which I would never have uh, believed a few years ago. Intense interest in Hawaii, Hawaii products, but also I think there's the human side, how to develop uh, young people to really take advantage and really make careers in Japan and I think, Steve, you were, we were talking about internships that could really kind of uh, make their pathway into careers in Japan easier. Right. Yeah, so about four years ago, um, we had this idea to start internships for our foreign exchange students at Japanese companies. Wow, yeah. And nobody else, and sure. actually to this day, I don't think any other Japanese university mm. is doing this. And frankly, when we started it, we had no idea if, number one, there would be interest from the students, right. and number two, the Japanese companies would actually allow us right. to put foreigners... It's kind it, of scary when you think it about is. it, and, and in, the in thing, a Japanese work environment, in an office. Yeah, you know, yeah. Picking up the phone, for example. <laughs> yeah, there's business etiquette. We yeah, actually yeah, teach yeah. them exactly. this. So, we announced it, and uh, there were no applicants, and we were getting worried, and typical students, all of a sudden, within the last like 12 hours before mm -hmm. the deadline, we had like 30 students apply. Hey. So we had enough. That was the first year. So we have students at Sumitomo Bank, right, right. at Komatsu, right. Kubota, Daikin. Yeah. That's all, but those are big companies in the Kansai area, right? Mostly, yeah. yeah. We're in the, since our school is based in the Kansai right. area, and the affiliation between Gaidai and Sumitomo Bank is very strong. So Terrific. They, yeah. this is the heart of the Kiretsu. Right, right. So once Sumitomo Bank said yes right. to us, then they recommended us to all these others. So we started this program, and I was focusing purely on business internships. It's turned out to be a wonderful success hmm. for two reasons. First of all, um, the foreign students are just delighted hmm. that they're able to work right. in a Japanese yeah. environment because they get classroom instruction, but to actually work. It's real life. Yeah, and it's yeah. a, it allows yeah. this bridge to a career right. in Japan, what we were talking about yeah. earlier. And then also the Japanese companies are delighted too because internships in Japan are considered to be kind of like introductions mm. and the Japanese students don't take it so seriously, yeah. but the foreign students do yeah. because internships are a bridge to employment mm. in, in America. 50% right. of uh, jobs after graduation are through internships That's correct. in the United yeah, States. Yeah. So it's turned out to be a wonderful success. So this, this summer we had 52 students wow. in internships. But uh, getting back to the JET program, yeah. when I announced this, I did it with only a business con uh, context. They were knocking on my door. We're not interested in business. We want to be teachers in Japan. Oh. So can you set up an internship program with the local schools? Yeah, so yeah. now actually, oh. of the 52, about 60% of the internships yeah. are done at local schools, oh. which then allows them to put teaching at a Japanese right. school on their resume. And I now, since we've been doing this long yeah. enough, I get email from my students. I've been accepted to the JET program. Oh. And part of the reason why is that oh. I've taught. So. And this will uh, get them back to Japan. And of then course. another pathway to uh, maybe uh, uh, future business opportunities. There are yeah. so many JETs. My experience is in the IT industry. Mm. So many JET graduates that are in the IT industry. 
so the Mormon, there's a Mormon group <laughs> that go to Japan. Okay. They're, in, right. uh, they're in business in uh, large right. numbers and also the JET group. Yeah. And the government's beginning to recognize that the JET is a talent pool right. for business activity. And, uh, and of course you learn how to interact with other Japanese teachers, Japanese parents, uh, uh, sure. Japanese language. Yep. Uh, so you really get a, a kind of a intense introduction to Japanese society right. through teaching English, yep. but yet you really are in a societal uh, you know, communications kind of situation sure. on a daily basis. Yeah, it's, it builds the basis for those individuals who are teaching to become successful in business because that teaching in business has in common. It's building relationships with people and fitting them in, within the culture to be successful. So I, I, we have to uh, ask my big question. Yes. yes. I, so I, so <laughs> we're, we're in the middle of 2018. Uh, 2017 was a pretty good year, uh, you know, uh, barely 1.5% growth. Uh, but to Japan, that's great. That's great. Uh, and we're in the middle of two, uh, July, uh, July of 2018. How does it look for, the, uh, for this year, for the rest of this year, going into 2019, which leads to the Olympics? Yep. Of course, there's a lot of construction for the Olympics, right. a lot of tourism. Uh, um, how the uh, entire economy doing? Mm. Yeah, I, as you know, we're, we're in multiple years now of Abenomics. We've right. had the same prime minister now for quite a while, and he has come up with a formula to try and revitalize the Japanese economy. And from my perspective, I would say that the results have been mixed. Uh, certainly the Nikkei is up, right. corporate savings, corporate uh, reserves are up. Um, unemployment down very much? Unemployment's yeah. down, and that's a combination right. of business activity, but also demographics. As you know, every right. year 500,000 people are exiting from the workforce. Oh, right, right. It's, it's a big number, yeah. so I think that's in part what's driving the, un uh, the unemployment numbers and, down. And, and the big thing was when he got in was to promote uh, the role of women in, in the workforce. That so was, what happened to that? Yeah, that was one of the tiers. I, I think in that area, it's not mixed. In that area, frankly, it's been a failure. Mm -hmm. So his goal was to have 30% representation in the diet for women right. and also in management levels within Japanese companies. When he started, it was 8%, and unfortunately, today, it's 8%. Okay. It has not changed. And, and you know, they, they did the sneaky yeah. thing about a year, year and a half ago. Like on a Friday night, they announced that the target is changing from 30 <laughs> to guess what number? Eight. <laughs> oh, we succeeded. We've hit 8%. Eight, eight percent. So that area, uh, unfortunately, been a little bit frustrating. As you know, I'm involved with the American Chamber of Commerce. Right, and how are American companies doing in Japan? Or, or is it the same issues uh, from before about market access, about no, uh, uh, no. Uh, issues have changed? Totally. Okay. So uh, just briefly, uh, I joined the ACCJ about five years ago and then was three years ago elected to become the vice president of the Kansai region. Right. It's so, a big place, yeah. yeah we have eco ec economic engine for Japan. Yeah, yeah. it's number two. We have P&G and Eli right. Lilly and AstraZeneca, right. Bayer. Those are all right. major members of the ACCJ Kansai region. So um, I've, I've, you know, I interact with the CEOs of Coca-Cola right. right. and Boeing and yeah. so forth. And the access issues that we've heard about historically, you know, right. back to the 80s and 90s, that is no longer okay. the problem whatsoever. And replaced, by, is, and replaced by what? Um, well, in some instances, uh, obsessive regulation, but I'm sure Japanese companies would also <laughs> complain about <laughs> right. that. The pharma mm -hmm. industry is, uh, the management of the health industry in Japan, since it's socialized right. medicine, is much more granular than mm -hmm. what American companies are used to in the United States. So there's some complaints along those lines. But in terms of access to the market mm -hmm. and support of Japanese government for uh, foreign entities in Japan, not an issue whatsoever. In fact, this is a dialogue that the ACCJ often has with the U.S. Embassy because the current administration, you know, we're involved in trade negotiations with Japan, and some of that is kind of reactive in terms of that was what Japan was like maybe a right, couple right. decades ago. Yeah. But if you talk to the business leaders, the people who are right. members of the ACCJ, um, you know, Japan is a growing market. In right. the pharmaceutical industry, Japan is, of course, is, yeah. you know, a lot of foreign companies right. are doing extremely well. Right. It's their number one growth opportunity right now. Longer term, they're investing in China, but Japan is just showing remarkable growth. Uh, insurance, you know, the, the head right. of the uh, ACCJ right now, uh, Sachin Shaw, he is the head of MetLife, insurance companies. Right, that's a huge area. AIG, Aflac and others. Aflac yeah, is yeah, a member yeah. of the ACCJ. They're all doing extremely well. Very good so, market. So the people who are represented with Boeing, yeah. unbelievably well. So no complaints. Yeah. The people who are represented in the ACCJ are very happy with how um, they're be, being able to develop their business in Japan. That is not an issue whatsoever. There are concerns longer term about Japanese growth and you know the the issue of um, 
the number of Japanese people. You know, it affects me as a professor and a dean. Uh, our school has 13,000 Japanese students right now, so it's quite successful. Oh, it's quite good. Yeah. But the number of high school graduates yeah. is going down yeah. every year, and the competition for students is increasing. That's so, right. So and, and there's been many, many new colleges and uh, Senmongako, you know, all kinds of. Uh, there was know, a new, huge expansion coming out of the yeah, 80s and 90s, right. and now there's oversaturation. Yeah. And, and many of these schools, frankly, are going to go out of business. How about immigration? Wow, that's, that's a tough one. Yeah. So I, I think still, because Jap Japan is 98% Japanese, there's a sense that Japan belongs to the Japanese. You know, I, my own personal story of working and living in Japan has been great. I never experienced any issues or any discrimination. I, I've had a wonderful career based in Japan and part in the rest of Asia. So my own personal story is a positive story. I was in the software industry, which is one that's industry right. that's yeah. dominated by uh, foreign companies. Um, but... Um, you know, overall, I, I don't think it's too much of an issue, frankly. Okay. And how about gambling? Oh, <laughs> that's a big one. So we're, and the ACCJ is involved in supporting that okay. since uh, Osaka is probably going to be one of the sites right. that's selected. Yeah. Uh, the ACCJ... It's uh, on a little island off of Osaka? Yeah, and, there's an yeah. island that's already been developed, yeah. and it, it looks like uh, Osaka is going to host the World's Fair right. in 2025. So those two things are kind of connected and, and together. And a lot of, lot of uh, flights into uh, Kangoo from uh, Asia, from uh, Absolutely. You know, Hong Kong and Korea so and China. Some of the uh, American companies right. that potentially will be the winner in right. Osaka, they're ACCJ members or they're also interested in education, right. hotel management education, That's so I've right. been talking to them. The numbers that they talk about yeah. in terms of investment and right. consight, minimum $10 billion. Wow. This will be the biggest injection of foreign capital yeah. into the Kansai region that I can think of you know, over the last 20 years. It will really dramatically change. And we're coming to an end. We are, okay. <laughs> We have to end on that note. Can well, we have more time? It, no, it, it, that's a whole other show that yeah. we can do. It's very exciting. On, on, on uh, developing that infrastructure for casino hotel management that does not exist in Japan today. It doesn't. Zero. And, and it has to be imported, and, and uh, there has to be a lot of training, education, a yep. new class of casino managers that right. have to be developed. And that's, we can talk about that on I'm, the next, next, uh, I'm, next time. Yes, I'm working on that at Kansai Gaida, actually, yeah, as well. Yeah, and, and it'll be an interesting, a fascinating area because, of course, Hawaii loves Vegas. And there's <laughs> 70,000 former Hawaii residents in Vegas. So this is the end of this show uh, with Steve Zerker from Kansai Gaida uh, University uh, on All About Leadership. Ray Tsuchiyama, thank you very much. Thank you, Ray.